Hello my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 character building guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're continuing with part 3 of my subclasses tier list, where we go over every single subclass in the game in significant detail, talk about their strengths and weaknesses, and what draws you to play that character, how they fit into a party, and what you should consider when you're building a character of that class, and how strong they are if you take 12 levels of that class, since this is a single class tier list. We'll be covering multi-class builds in a future installment, and also I already covered the base classes in a previous tier list, so if you haven't seen that, make sure to check it out. Before I begin, so, uh, we already know the drill and sort of how we're going over these things, but I do have one quick sort of update or correction to make, um, and then also going to just quickly go over the tiers again so we're all on the same page before we start. So first off, I want to mention that I uh, did undersell Open Palm Monk a little bit in my previous video, because I, I Forgot to mention that, of course, they get the additional bonus action um, in addition to their key recovery, which does allow them to make six attacks in a round once uh, per day or a couple times once per day. And that is obviously very powerful and brings their burst damage up. So for certain fights, once per long rest, you do get to increase their burst damage massively. I don't believe that moves them up into S plus tier, but definitely something that I should have mentioned when discussing the character. And secondly is that the saga of the Eldritch Knight icons continues, because as it turns out, these are wrong in-game, um, as well as on the wiki, or potentially the wiki's right and the game is wrong, it's not entirely clear, because in the level up screen, this is Battlemaster and this is Eldritch Knight, but in the character sheet, this is Battlemaster and this is Eldritch Knight. I'm going to assume that this one that's sort of a banner um, is was intended to be Battlemaster, and this one that's got the flames was intended to be Eldritch Knight, but it's not clear which one they actually meant, since it's different across two different places in the game. Uh, hopefully that gets fixed at some point, because that's kind of a silly error for them to have made. But for now, this is, on this tier list, this is Eldritch Knight in S tier, and this is Battlemaster in A tier. Sorry for the confusion, everyone. Also, just to quickly go over the tiers, in S plus tier, I'm placing subclasses that give you way too much and are out of scale for the balancing intentions of the game. In S tier, we have characters that are both incredibly versatile and incredibly powerful. In A tier, characters that are either incredibly versatile or incredibly powerful, but fall short in one of those two metrics. In B tier, characters that are neither as powerful nor as versatile as the S tier characters, um, and so... Well, while still great characters in their own right, do suffer a little bit by comparison. And then in C tier, I have characters that are restricting your that restrict your strategy in some way, either by having a significant drawback that you have to play around, or by just not having quite as much of the thing that they bring to your party as you need a party member to actually bring. And finally, in the f uh, the last tier, the outclassed tier, I'm placing subclasses that fulfill exactly the same role as another subclass within that class. So the characters are intended to do exactly the same thing, but it just does it worse than the other subclass. For example, Valor Bard has basically no abilities that Swords Bard doesn't get, and so while Valor Bard is still an excellent character in its own right, um, it is totally superseded by Swords Bard, which does the same thing but better and more things. I'm judging these classes on three metrics. One is just the raw power that they bring to the table, so how much damage do they do for damage dealers, how much control do they do for controllers, and so on. Two is how easy is it to fit them into a party, so how many different roles can they fill, how greedy are they for items, how much support do they need from your party members. Um, and three is how forgiving are they of play mistakes. So, for example, an Eldritch Knight, uh, if you built as a thrower, is a ranged character who's extremely tanky, has the shield spell and long strider and so on, and can barely ever miss your attacks because of the broken nature of Tavern Brawler. So even if you put your Eldritch Knight in a bad position, it's very unlikely to cost you a combat, and therefore it's extremely forgiving of play mistakes. I think that should count pretty heavily in a game mode as long as honor mode. I will be tilting these subclasses a little more heavily towards raw power than towards versatility, um, whereas the base class, I would more emphasize versatility a little more, because once you're choosing a subclass, you've already sort of chosen the role that your party member is going to fulfill, and so we should judge it based more on how well it fills that role than on how many different roles it can fill at this point in the tier list. Alright, without further ado, let's jump in and start rating the classes. 
we'll start with Draconic Sorcerer. So Sorcerer, I rated S tier in my class tier list. Um, and I think, in fact, that Sorcerer's base mechanics, as implemented in Baldur's Gate 3, are the closest to being S plus of any of these classes, because there's a significant change in how Sorcerers work from the tabletop game to the to Baldur's Gate. That is that in tabletop, you can't cast multiple leveled spells in a turn. So even if you quicken one spell, you can cast a cantrip with your second action, but you can't cast a, a leveled up spell with your second action. No double fireball turns. In Baldur's Gate, they've gotten rid of that restriction. So you can cast as uh, spells of whatever level, as long as you have the sorcery points to quicken them, meaning that sorcerers basically get two actions for every other character's one. That gives them an incredibly high baseline, so it really does not take much for a sorcerer uh, subclass to be an incredibly strong character. So what does Draconic Sorcerer get? Well, you get two initial buffs that are both pretty reasonable. You get Draconic Resilience that gives you um, 13 armor class, whether as long as you're not wearing armor. Um, so basically you just have free mage armor up all the time. Not a huge bonus because you could just have mage armor, but still a, a reasonable upgrade that makes it a little more convenient, mostly, to wear robes. And you get an additional hit point per level. One additional hit point per level doesn't sound like much, but that's a pretty fair percentage of your total hit points when you're a max level sorcerer. So if you're, you will probably have somewhere in the range of 60 to 70 hit points at level 12 as a sorcerer. So adding 12 to that is increasing your total hit points by a, a sixth or a seventh. And that's a pretty reasonable addition to your hit point total. Um, that means that Draconic Sorcerers, especially when combined with other defensive options that sorcerers get, are surprisingly tanky for spellcasters. Still not tanky, don't get me wrong here, but they're a little more resilient than other spellcasters because of the additional hit points. You also get to pick an Ancestry, and this gives you two things. One is it chooses a damage type, so different Draconic Ancestries give you different associated damage types, which don't do anything initially, but give you uh, advantages using that elemental damage type as you level up, and you also get a bonus spell. Most of these spells are already on the Sorcerer list, and so there's not a huge benefit to taking them, but there are, I believe, two that aren't on the Sorcerer list already. Uh, if you are a White Dragon, you get Armor of Agathis, which is a really nice one to have access to, and if you are a Copper Dragon, you get Tasha's Hideous Laughter. I think there's no other ones that aren't already on the Sorcerer spell list. Let me know if I missed one. Of these, the really good ones are probably the White Dragon, because cold damage is a good damage type to associate with, lots of powerful cold damage effects, and there's some items that trigger off of cold damage, and Armor of Agathis is a pretty nice spell to add to the Sorcerer spell list. Um, Copper Dragon, uh, or sorry, excuse me, Bronze Dragon gives you Lightning and gives you Fog Cloud, which is also very useful, or Blue Dragon gives you Lightning and Witch Bolt. If you're not doing a Witch Bolt combo attacking build, um, like my one-shot Lightning, Lord, then you're probably better off with Bronze Dragon to get the lightning damage, because Fog Cloud is a very relevant spell to have all the time. If you really want to do uh, a fire damage build, of course, which are very powerful with Draconic Sorcerers, um, there aren't ones that give you great spells, but having Disguise Self is never bad, so a Gold Dragon can be useful. Um, and Brass Dragon at least gives you sleep, which is okay in the early game. I wouldn't bother with Burning Hands, it's just not a very powerful spell early on. But overall, I think it doesn't really matter which Fire Dragon you pick. I typically avoid Acid or Poison Dragon, because the, there's less synergy with those damage types, although it really, for most Draconic Sorcerer builds, what elemental damage type you pick will not be a huge component of the damage that the of the character's power level. You're still just a fully-fledged sorcerer, even if you never use your elemental abilities, so you can also pick these based on theme. However, the they do give you access to a few really powerful builds because of class features that you get later on. At level 6, you get Elemental Damage Affinity and Elemental Damage Resistance, and or Elemental Affinity Damage and Resistance, which let you 
add your charisma modifier whenever you deal damage of the associated type. That's incredibly powerful, especially with cold, lightning, or fire damage for various reasons. Cold and lightning, of course, you can double that damage using the wet condition, so that's an incredibly powerful buff because it's probably adding 10 or more damage to every spell that you're casting, and it will work in, with AoE spells and everything, so that's a lot of extra damage. And with fire, you get to add it to Scorching Ray, where it adds to each ray. So some of the most powerful damage builds are draconic, uh, are fire damage draconic sorcerers that use leveled up scorching rays. A six level scorching ray fires seven rays. So you're adding 35 damage to the cast of that spell at base before even taking into account items and, and whatever that can increase the damage of Scorching Ray to massive levels. That's one broken build you can do with Draconic Sorcerer, but in general, um, just adding a bunch of damage to all of your damage spells is pretty powerful and often takes them over the threshold of one-shotting enemies, which is what you want when you're casting a damage spell. The whole point of a damage spell, as opposed to just making a weapon attack, is to actually kill something in one shot. And so adding damage consistency to those spell effects is very powerful. You can also benefit... Uh, it, it's also worth noting that the cold damage sorcerer buffs the best cantrip in the in the game, Ray of Frost, um, but also you can buff Firebolt and still be pretty happy. So there's a lot of different options here when you're picking your Draconic Element to do a lot of extra damage. You also uh, can spend a Sorcery Point whenever you cast a spell of that type to gain resistance to damage of that type. That will come up, like, maybe once in the entire game, but, you know, when, when it does come up, you're happy to have it. And then at level 11, you get Fly. Uh, permanent Flying is pretty cool. It lets you reposition based on height and everything, but flying in Baldur's Gate is less powerful than it sounds like. For one thing, you can get permanent flying from an illithid ability, so it's it's not unique to Draconic Sorcerer. Still nice that they have access to it, but for another, flying in Baldur's Gate isn't really flying, it's hopping, and so it's somewhat redundant with just the ability to jump that every character has. This does give you quite a lot of extra mobility in combat, but by level 11 you probably have access to Misty Step and, and Enhanced Leap and Long Strider and all of the other mobility options. So if you haven't solved your mobility problems by level 11, then you probably should have. Uh, I guess you, you have been doing something wrong for the whole game, um, and I don't know quite how you made it to level 11 without having mobility options. But the fly is a nice little bonus that will help you out. Not a major component of the characters uh, of the Draconic Sorcerer's class power. The additional damage equal to Charisma is where most of this subclass's power budget is spent, but that's a huge bonus that has all kinds of implications, as well as giving you access to a bunch of the most broken builds in the game in terms of doubling or uh, septupling this bonus with scorching rays and so of course draconic sorcerer being a powerful sorcerer with a, a great class feature is an s tier character storm sorcerer it's a little funny to me that we have draconic sorcerer for lightning damage and then a whole lightning damage focused subclass in addition to that but storm sorcerer is probably the better choice if you really want to focus on lightning damage um because the aoe damage will add to more most of the time than the Draconic Sorcerer damage. Either one will be totally reasonable if you want to focus on lightning damage. That being said, Storm Sorcerer isn't really a lightning damage focused class. It has a bunch of lightning damage abilities, but most of what you get is really powerful for any sorcerer and does not have to be focused on, on doing lightning damage or casting lightning or thunder themed spells in order to get the strengths of this character. You get at level 1 Tempestuous Magic, which lets you whenever you cast a spell, a leveled spell, so not a cantrip, you can fly as a bonus action until the end of your turn without receiving opportunity attacks. This lets you uh, fly up to your movement speed. Um, the tooltip says 30 feet, but it is actually based on your movement speed as a character, so the tooltip is incorrect. Um, but that flight not costing opportunity attacks and just letting you fly from very early in the game is super powerful. It may come as a bit of a surprise because I just talked crap about the Draconic Sorcerer's flight ability and the Storm Sorcerer's requires activation, requires resources to be spent to be used. But the difference between getting this ability at level 11 and getting it at level 1 is massive. Obviously having 
flight by the time you're level 11 you should definitely have gotten your mobility problems sorted out but at level one getting access to a really powerful mobility skill very early in the game will make your early game significantly smoother and make it much harder for you to end up with your with your storm sorcerer in melee or in bad situations because you can cast a spell and leave the immunity to opportunity attacks is also super powerful and lets you just get out of any bad situation very frequently. People often uh, talk about how much they love Shocking Grasp, which I, I mostly disagree with, but this turns every spell into Shocking Grasp, where enemy, it will deny enemy reactions, and it works on groups of enemies, so even if you're surrounded, you can get away. Um, and then you are able to escape even the worst possible situations, as long as you still have a few hit points. Obviously, that's an incredibly powerful feature, but it's also worth noting that flight early in the game is better than flight later in the game, simply because the arenas uh, in Act 1 are more are both smaller but also more vertical than the arenas in Act 2 and 3, uh, because they, I mean, to be brutally frank, because they are better designed and had more time in testing, because the, that was the act that was released for early access. The arenas in Act 1 have tend to have a lot more verticality and a lot more interesting terrain features and also ha involve enemies who can't just bypass all of the verticality anyways. If you go up onto the rap rafters in the goblin camp, the goblins mostly won't be able to follow you. Later on in the game, if you go up into the rafters, enemies will just have ranged options or be able to follow you easily, and it won't be as huge an advantage. Getting access to that kind of mobility early is super powerful. And then, of course, a lot of fights in Act 2, like all the outdoor fights in Act 2 are uh, take place on just basically flat, open, featureless ground, and most of the indoor arenas are big empty rooms, where mobility becomes much less of a concern. In Act 1, vertical mobility is incredibly powerful, but it does fall off as the game goes on, just because of the nature of the combat arenas that you're fighting in. At higher levels, you get some additional bonuses. You get Heart of the Storm, which at level 6, which does additional damage uh, based on thunder or lightning whenever you cast a lightning or thunder spell. This damage is equal to half of your sorcerer level, so it's a small amount of damage, but done in an AoE, and it will, importantly, add all of your rider effects, whatever rider effects you have on extra spell damage, um, and can, give, can, as a result, do a lot of cool effects. Things like reverberation from the thunder damage, or just generally speaking, anything that adds to your spell damage will go off with Heart of the Storm, and that's obviously very powerful. And as you level up, you gain, uh, and you also gain resistance to lightning and thunder damage, which are hard resistances to get in general, and not the most common damage from enemies, but relevant in some encounters. Having damage resistance is certainly never bad, definitely not the largest bonus, but a, a small bonus. And uh, you also get additional spells, uh, basically like a cleric domain, as you level up. The additional spell access means that you're much more flexible in terms of what other spells you take, and some of them are really good. Create or Destroy Water obviously works very well with your theme, because you, you get this on a on a sorcerer, which is uh, hard, which you is very powerful to have access to on a sorcerer, especially because you're theoretically a lightning damage focused sorcerer, although again, you don't have to be. Um, and Sleet Storm and Call Lightning are two just excellent spells that it's great to have access to on this character. You'll never be sad to have them. Thunder Wave is one you probably wouldn't spend a spell known slot on, but you're very happy to just have it when it's given to you from your domain. Finally, at level 11, you get an ability that triggers when you take a melee attack, so that's mostly irrelevant, but the class features that you get from Storm Sorcerer throughout the game are all really powerful, they play really well into your theme, and they give you a lot of safety in the early game, and a lot of flexibility in terms of your spell selection, so obviously Storm Sorcerer, in combined with the extremely powerful nature of the sorcerer base class, is an S-tier class, and... Uh, it, my personal favorite sorcerer, because I really like the flying movement, and I think it's fun and tactical, but um, just in general, a very solid class to play. Wild Magic. So Wild Magic Sorcerer is one that you'll often hear people say, never ever play this character in honor mode. I disagree. I think that Wild Magic Sorcerer is totally playable in honor mode, and in fact, one of the most fun honor mode playthroughs you can possibly have. It breaks one of the main negative play patterns of honor mode, because I think that often honor mode playthroughs uh, devolve into using the same strategy in combat over and over again, and playing the same turn over and over again, because you, you just use one sort of broken mechanic. Wild Magic Sorcerer 
throws a wrench into the works by having random effects happen in combat, which you then have to react to. That means that your playthrough ends up more varied and interesting than a lot of other possible playthroughs uh, with the game, because you have, have to react to things on the fly, rather than getting to plan everything out in advance. Wild Magic Sorcerer gives you random effects that trigger whenever you cast a leveled up spell through the Wild Magic class feature. By default, there's a 5% chance whenever you cast a, a Wild Magic spell of one of these triggering, but you can increase the chance to 50% by using the Tides of Chaos ability. Tides of Chaos is a very powerful ability, but increasing the Wild Magic Surge chance to 50% is a pretty significant downside. Also, it is irritating to me that those numbers are not shown anywhere in the tool tips or in-game or anything, and you have to learn those by trial and error, uh, but those are the, the accurate numbers for Wild Magic. So basically what you need to know is how many different Wild Magic effects are there, how many are good and how many are bad, and how do you play around the worst of them and to maximize the best of them in order to gain benefit from these Wild Magic Surges. There are, by my count, 23 different Wild Magic effects, um, which means that on a given turn there's a slightly less than 1 in 400 chance of any of them happening, because you only have a 5% chance of one of them triggering, and then a roughly 5% chance of e each individual one triggering. Of course, as we know, since we've played a lot of this game, a 1 in 400 chance is the same chance as rolling two natural ones in a row. So it's gonna happen, and it will happen more frequently than you might like, that you get specifically the worst wild magic surge for you, which is usually the Cambion appearing, but I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, and so you really have to plan all of your fights around the possibility of having the worst possible outcome from your wild magic surges. You can also increase the chance of wild magic surges if you want them by using Tides of Chaos. Tides of Chaos, also available from level 1, gives you advantage on your next attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, which is a hugely powerful ability, and it's a reaction that doesn't actually take a reaction. So similar to Reckless Attack, you can use it to turn misses into hits or failed saving throws into successes, which is incredibly powerful. But then your next, uh, the next time you cast a spell, you'll have a 50% chance of the wild magic surge instead of 5%. So it's really important to know how to play around the Wild Magic Surges. In general, about 60% of them are good for you, about 20% of them don't really do anything, and about 20% of them are pretty bad for you. But you can maximize the good ones and minimize the bad ones through careful positioning. Most of the negative effects, so the effects that hit everybody in an AoE around you for damage or whatever, have a range of 30 feet, and most of the positive effects have a range of 20 feet. So if you are more than 30 feet from your allies, and more than 20 feet from your enemies, you sh uh, minimize the chances of you doing something bad to your allies or buffing your enemies. This is pretty important because some of the positive effects are really powerful, like guaranteed critical hits, which if you give them to your enemies is very dangerous. Um, that being said, you can't eliminate the chance of terrible things happening entirely. One of the worst things that can happen is it can summon a Cambion that's hostile to everybody, and it will appear near your Sorcerer, which is obviously, um, especially if you've positioned your Sorcerer away from your allies, is really dangerous. In the late game, this mostly won't matter. One Cambion, more or less, is not going to make the difference between a won or lost fight. But in the early game, obviously, an unexpected Cambion can be an instant party wipe. And so you do have to be very careful with when and how you cast spells, and make sure that you can always deal with the worst possible effects. That means that to play Wild Magic Sorcerer optimally, and I, I honestly, I don't recommend playing it optimally. I recommend just going in blind and having fun with it. Um, but to play it optimally, most tactically, uh, you want to memorize the table and think about what possible effects could happen and how you would react to them every time you cast a spell. That's a lot of extra work, so that's why I don't recommend doing it, but you should have a good sense of how to play around the possible effects. And the positioning thing, where you're 30 feet from allies and 20 feet from enemies, is will help go a long way for that. However, if you do that, that's going to be a pretty restricted uh, restrictive play style, and it will only come up sometimes, so it's going to feel pretty silly to do a lot of the time where you are restricting your play style in order to generate, uh, to minimize the chances of something going horribly wrong. You're giving up advantages that you would have through 
different positioning or casting spells when you might decide that it's too risky to cast a spell and instead you want to cast a cantrip, you're definitely giving up stuff in order to bring your wild magic sorcerer. However, you also get some other powerful abilities as you level up, which go very well uh, with these effects because you at level six get bend luck which is basically you can spend two sorcery points for guidance or for bane um increasing your party members ability checks by a d4 or decreasing um ability checks attack rolls or saving throws by a d4 so basically a mini bardic inspiration or decreasing an enemy's attack roll or saving throw by a d4 so um, basically a mini cutting words for two sorcery points this isn't like the most amazing deal but it's going to turn misses into hits and that's incredible and turn uh failed saves into successes or succeeded saves into failures and obviously that's extremely powerful uh, that that is a very very useful ability and it only costs sorcery points which are a relatively plentiful resource so you basically get to have a lot of the benefits of being a bard while also being a sorcerer which is an incredibly strong thing to be that being said, the way that you have to play around the dangers of wild magic restrict your strategy significantly. And so because of the restricted positioning, the chance of getting a, uh, an instant party wipe if you lapse on your positioning or if you just re get really unlucky, if a fight's going badly, you can often pile uh, misfortune onto more misfortune, because if a fight's going badly, maybe you've used Tides of Chaos to try to land an important attack. Um, and this does work with spells with attack rolls, by the way, so that, that is very useful for wild magic. Um, but then you now have to play around the chance of getting a, a terrible result on your wild magic surge, because you have a 50% chance of one happening, and that's going to restrict any future turns. So it means that while your combats are you're still a, a, a sorcerer. You still have lots and lots of tools to deal with combats that are going badly, but your combats will be going badly more, and you have to be a little more careful when things start to turn against you, not to make them significantly worse. Overall, I would say that Wild Magic Sorcerer is... Uh, C tier because it restricts your strategy significantly, although it brings a lot of power to the table because it's a sorcerer. Um, but I also think that it's one of the most fun possible honor mode playthroughs and will force you to change your strategy on the fly, something that Baldur's Gate often doesn't do. And so I highly recommend playing this character, even though from a, a purely power level standpoint, uh, or I guess not power level, but like how it fits into this tier list standpoint, it's a C tier character. Warlocks. So Warlocks I rated A tier in my class tier list because they are very sustainable using their highest level spells on short rest cooldowns. They have access to a bunch of broken combos like Darkness and Devil Sight. They get Hunger of Hadar. They're not that flexible from combat to combat because mostly what you're doing is Hunger of Hadar and then repelling blast people back into Hunger of Hadar. And that place play pattern holds true across all three Warlock um, Pacts, but that is a very powerful play style, and of course they give you access to dialogue skills and everything, so just a great character. They really don't need that much from their subclasses in order to be a character that excels in an honor mode playthrough. I'll start with Archfey Warlock, which is often considered the weakest of the three, although I tend to think that Archfey is actually quite underrated. Some of the abilities they get are pretty powerful. Archfey Warlock gets a uh, Fey Presence at level 1, which lets you do uh, in a short range, so 10 feet from you, do an AoE Fear or Charm. An AoE Fear at level 1 in, with a with a short rest cooldown is pretty powerful and is basically an extra disable. Um, like Fiend Warlock gets Command at level 1, which is one of the things they're going to be doing. Uh, Fey Presence is almost as good as that, comes back on a short rest, just like your actual spells, and is AoE. So that's going to be a pretty powerful boost for the first few levels. It'll fall off pretty quickly at later levels as you get access to AoE spells, um, and as, for example, Fiend Warlock's Command becomes multi-target because it's getting the auto-scaling. But in general... Uh, Fey Presence is still just a pretty powerful disable, and especially for the early game, you can run into groups of enemies, activate it, and um, 
and you'll hit a lot of enemies. Since it uses your Charisma save DC, a lot of enemies are going to be feared, and you can run in, activate it, and then use a bonus action jump, plus the rest of your movement to get out. Also, if enemies get close to you, you'll be able to escape from them, uh, from any enemies that the fear fails on. I'd, I'd say this is actually a pretty powerful ability. Um, it also has two turns of duration, and so it's one of the very few ways to do two full turns of Disable starting from level one available in the game. So it's just a, 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 an extremely powerful early level ability. You get some additional spells, and most of them are not particularly strong. Um, Fairy Fire is okay. Sleep is pretty useless to a Warlock in general, Um because you, you'd rather just kill enemies most of the time at level 1. Uh, Calm Emotions and is fine. Phantasmal Force is terrible. Um, the big hit here is Plant Growth, and then uh, Greater Invisibility is fine at if you're doing that strategy. But the, the big win on your spell list is Plant Growth, which is very useful to a Warlock. Plant Growth plus Hunger of Hadar, of course, is an incredibly potent combo, so if you want to blow two of your spell slots in, in one turn of combat, then you can set that up and cripple enemies and just win fights instantly through that. You also get Misty Escape, Escape, a reaction ability that makes you invisible when you take damage, and then on your next turn you get a free Misty Step, which then breaks your invisibility. But becoming invisible on taking damage means that you're only going to take one hit that turn, most likely, and so that's a very powerful effect as well um, that can get you out of uh, bad situations pretty easily. One of the things that Warlocks do sometimes suffer from is just getting jumped on, because they're concentrating on Hunger of Hadar, and they're... Uh, relatively vulnerable, and they want to be in range to be Eldritch Blasting, don't have a lot of inbuilt mobility typically. So having an escape option that comes with mobility and prevents you from dying, it's a great reaction. Also just a very solid ability. At level 10, you become immune to Charmed, which is totally useless, uh, or not totally useless, but almost useless and kind of a bad capstone. I wish they got something a little different there, but both of those, the abilities that they do get, are very strong, um, very much worth having, and so I think Archfey Warlock is absolutely an A-tier Warlock. Fiend. Of the three Warlock packs, Fiend has probably the worst just generic abilities, but um, you have also one of the better spell lists, so the additional spells that you get are really good. You get Command at level 1, which is incredibly powerful just because Command is great, obviously, but especially good for a Warlock because it auto-levels up. So as you level up, you're going to be casting it with higher level spell slots and will be commanding multiple creatures without having to spend a more important resource. You also get some decent damage spells. Uh, most of those are not that useful, but you also get Wall of Fire, which is really nice to have access to, especially because at, say, level 7, Wall of Fire, casting Wall of Fire would cost your Sorcerer or Wizard um, or Druid their most important spell slot, whereas for you, it's just one spell slot that you get for that day, and so Wall of Fire, which is a, a situational spell that solves some encounters entirely, especially in Act 2, when you're going to be level 7, is a an addition to a party that doesn't cost you much resources as a Fiend Warlock and will just one-shot certain encounters in a very easy and resource-free way. So th that is a pretty significant boost to have on your spell list. You also get, whenever you kill an enemy, you gain... Um, Temporary hit points equal to your Charisma plus your Warlock level. That's going to be a lot of temporary hit points at, at high levels. It does conflict somewhat with um, the Warlock's best item, the Potent Robe. But if you're Monoclass Fiend Warlock, then this is going to be a lot of temporary hit points. And you'll be killing enemies pretty regularly, because you'll be using Eldritch Blasts and your decent damaging spell list. And so you, you'll be generating a lot of temporary hit points, which helps your Warlock sustain, which otherwise is something that they have trouble doing. Warlocks are relatively squishy and vulnerable, and so having the defensive abilities, much like Archfey Warlock's Misty Escape, uh, this the additional temporary hit points are pretty powerful. Warlocks also get access to Blade Ward uh, by default, which means that, which is pretty nice because it lets you protect those temporary hit points. So you can benefit from those, um, and of course you can use it to protect Armor of Agathis. Now it is, it is uh, redundant with Armor of Agathis, so Fiend Warlocks usually won't be using that strategy, but that's okay because you just don't you will use it in like the early game and then you can just swap it out and then you just take one of your other more important spells later on 
You also get, at level 6, Dark One's Own Luck, which lets you add a D10 to a skill check once per short rest. That's a huge boost. I mean, that's more than double Guidance, so that is a pretty impressive addition to your arsenal, and will let you just pass skill checks pretty frequently. Um, it's great for dialogue skills, and as a charisma character, of course, dialogue skills are something you're very likely to be doing, but will also just uh, allow you to, you know, make disarm traps or do anything that you particularly need to do. Very useful to have in the late game when you're trying to do uh, the mirror or any of the other really important skill checks. Having this ability it, as a situational boost is very powerful as well. Finally, at level 10, you get a changeable damage resistance, and notably this damage resistance can be anything. It's not just elemental damage, and you can change it uh, based once per short rest based on the encounters that you're going to face. This means you'll basically always have resistance to the most common damage that you're going to be facing in an encounter, which combined with your generation of temporary hit points makes Fiend Warlocks really hard to kill, while also dishing out very consistent and, and powerful control effects or damage effects. So just, a, a, again, a very solid character that will very easily cruise through honor mode, A tier. Great old one. Great Old One or Gulaks are probably the generically most powerful and, and sort of most common Warlock. For most Warlock builds, you're best off with a Great Old One build because of Mortal Reminder. Mortal, Mortal Reminder is whenever you land a critical hit, which because you're a Warlock is going to be pretty frequently because you'll be Eldritch Blasting, and when you fire an Eldritch Blast at uh, level 10 or higher, it's going to have three beams, all of which can individually critical hit. So you have very frequent critical hits, very high chances to critical hit. Whenever you land one, the target and um, nearby creatures have to succeed on a saving throw, which of course is a wisdom save based on your charisma, um, or become frightened. Frightened, like we talked about, a very powerful condition, and applying it for free is incredible. Just constantly dishing out these crowd control effects is something that is going to be super powerful about your great old one. And so any Eldritch Eldritch Blasting build, excuse me, um, that uses that that it wants to focus primarily on Eldritch Blasts should probably be Great Old One. You also get a, a very solid spell list for a Warlock, so your additional spells are excellent. Dissonant Whispers fills a big hole in your early game combat, so it gives you some burst damage and a crowd control effect. Um, and later on you get Slow, which is quite nice to add to the Warlock's arsenal because you get um, you have a lot of AoE damage effects that you can't use when allies are in the mix, or AoE control effects. I guess you've got one. You've got Hunger of Hadar, but it's the best one. Um, but you can't use it when allies are mixed up with the enemies. Slow lets you have a crowd control effect that works even when allies and enemies are all mixed together. Evard's Black Tentacles combos well with um, any like walls of fire from your allies. So while it's not an incredibly powerful spell, it's nice to have access to somewhere in your party. Um, and then telekinesis lets you one-shot things. All of these spells are a lot better, and you'll notice that some of these are spells I rated fairly low tiers on low tier on my spell tier list. But Warlocks can use more situational spells much better because they aren't expending high-level spell slots or. Uh, to, to use them. Since Warlock spell slots are always max level, it's not the same resource expenditure to cast Telekinesis as it is for another spellcaster. That means that these kinds of more situational spells like Slow or Evards or Telekinesis are all really useful to have on a Warlock and let you use those spells in ways that are optimal without having to spend resources on acquiring them. Combined with the free crowd control effects from Mortal Reminder, this makes the Goo Warlock both really good at dishing out damage and really good at dishing out control, and that's what you want from a hybrid spellcaster damage dealer like a, a Warlock. You also, at level 6, uh, get Entropic Ward, where you can impose disadvantage on an attack roll against you, and then if they miss, you gain advantage on your next attack roll against the attacker. Advantage, of course, is great for you, because more critical hits means more fears, but also reactive disadvantage is very powerful, as we talked about with Light Cleric and, and everything already. Um, and then... At level 10, you get Psychic Resistance, obviously much worse than Fiend's Variable Resistance, uh, but you also deal damage back when you take Psychic Damage. That does matter because in Baldur's Gate, a lot of the late game enemies are Psychic Damage dealers, and so you will be taking Psychic Damage occasionally and dealing it back. Um, but for the most part, that's a very, very minor 
boost in the end game, and you're mostly there for Mortal Reminder from level 1. I would say that Goo Warlock actually benefits the least from the restriction to Mono Class Warlock. The other two Warlock classes gain from that, because Goo Warlock gets a lot of its power budget at level 1, but is still just an excellent character that you can take all the way through, and I'm going to rate it A tier. I'll also mention for the Warlocks that there are three Pacts for the Warlocks, which are basically also subclasses, uh, Blade, Chain, and Tome. Blade Pact Warlock for a mono classed Warlock can go, and, and all three of them can be used with any of these subclasses, and I think they'll all be good, and there's no, there's no bad pick for Honor Mode. Um, Blade Pact Warlock for a mono class Warlock probably benefits the least, because it's not that often that your Blade Weapon, blade weapon attacks are better than just using Eldritch Blast. Uh, Chain Warlock is probably the strongest of them for Honor Mode, because the Imp is incredible, uh, and then and the, the summon is incredible for scouting and doing extra damage and everything, and Tome Warlock is always good, Guidance is great to add to your party. None of those pacts change the tiers of the Warlocks, but, um, <laughs> which sounds like a sounds like a bad fantasy novel, the tiers of the Warlocks, um, but... Overall, I think you you will be happy with any of them, and you should pick one that is based on the concept of your character. It will change how your character plays out, but it won't change the effectiveness of your character. I think any combination, any of the possible combinations of Warlock Pacts and subclasses are all A tier. Wizard. Wizard, I think, has some of the highest variants between their subclasses of any of the classes, because they get each uh, subclass gets three abilities, each magic school gets three abilities, and some of these abilities that you get at level two are like the best abilities in the entire game, and some of the abilities that you get um, all the way through to level 10 do literally nothing. So how strong your wizard is does depend quite heavily on what subclass you select for your wizard. Wizards also have benefited a lot from a rules change from Tabletop to Baldur's Gate, where you can swap your prepared spells at any time outside of combat. In Tabletop, you have to prepare, choose your spell list for the day at the beginning of the day, and can't just swap based on what you're going to face. Um, so wizards are even more versatile in Baldur's Gate, and that means that the ability to specialize in specifics uh, spells based on your spell school is less important in Baldur's Gate than it is in Tabletop. So your subclass has less, um, gives you less in that sense, because specializing in specific spells is just less important than it is in Tabletop, since you'll be varying your spells cast more over the course of a game. We'll start with Abjuration School. So Abjuration Wizard gets you uh, three different abilities, although two of them are the same ability, and then uh, and then the third one is just a buff to the same ability. Really, it's actually, never mind, it's just one ability. You get one ability from, uh, from Abjuration Wizard, and it gets better as you level up. It halves the cost also of uh, learning abjuration spells from scrolls, but money is free in this game, so while every spell, every wizard school learns their associated spells better, that doesn't matter at all, or cheaper, that doesn't matter at all. Abjuration Wizard gives you Arcane Ward. So whenever you cast an Abjuration spell, you gain one intensity uh, per level of the spell that you cast. So if you cast a level 3 Abjuration spell, like Glyph of Warding, you gain 3 intensity. Uh, up to a maximum of twice your wizard level. So at max level, up to 24. At, say, level 5, up to 10. Whenever you take damage, you reduce the damage by the intensity, uh, and then reduce the intensity by one. So if you take a hit at, if you're level 12 and have a 24 intensity ward, you take a hit, you take that damage minus 24, and then the intensity drops to 23. This is a significant change from the tabletop version of this ability, which basically just works as like temporary hit points. The, the ward intensity just... Uh, decreases by the damage that you take, and you gain a little more per cast, but overall it's just temporary hit points rather than these this layers of ablative damage reduction that uh, Abjuration Wizard gets. At level 6, you can uh, reduce the damage to an ally, so you can basically use your Arcane Ward um, on on an ally as a reaction, and at level 10, uh, whenever you take a short rest, you gain a bunch of free intensity on your ward, so you can keep it up for longer. 
As a monoclass wizard, there are some things that are a little bit different compared to the multi-class builds that usually use this. You can't build up your ward for free using the, the Warlock uh, invocations, and you can't uh, get Armor of Agathis on this character to do the retaliation build. However, the damage reduction that you get from this build if you just cast Abjuration spells in combat, and it's worth noting that one of the most powerful spells combat spells in the game, powerful non-concentration spammable combat spells in the game, is Glyph of Warding, which is an abjuration spell that'll give you three intensity on your uh, on your arcane ward. The amount of damage reduction that you get is insane. Reducing incoming damage by twice your level will often reduce it to zero, or will completely or, or reduce it to trivial amounts that are then easily healed up. You also can reduce this damage even further by adding additional sources of damage reduction. Even without armor proficiencies, the Bone Spike Garb lets you add two more damage reduction to your character. Adding damage resistances, like Elemental Resistance or Blade Ward or anything along those lines, um, I guess, uh, which you can get from an ally healing you. Uh, and this gives your wizard effectively thousands of hit points because the amount of damage that you need to take before you are ever in danger of dying are in the hundreds or even in the late game thousands. It's very possible that you can, with appropriate damage reduction and healing, survive 10,000 incoming damage. And I'm not exaggerating with that number um, if you continuously reapply your arcane ward. And so you can, you can sit in some of the most dangerous encounters in the game continuously taking damage and negate almost all of the incoming damage, heal it back up very, very easily. If you're getting the buff on heal blade ward from a, a cleric ally or whatever, you can continuously re uh, reduce the damage. And it's notable that damage resistance applies before damage reduction. So if you have anything that's having incoming damage, it halves it and then you apply the flat damage reduction. That means that Abjuration Wizard has so many more effective hit points and is basically unkillable. This rules change from tabletop is, I'll be honest, silly. This is just too powerful. Wizards are not supposed to have 10,000 effective hit points, and Abjuration Wizard, as a result, is an S plus tier character that totally breaks the game um, by virtue of just literally being impossible to kill. It is true that in the first like three levels or so, your damage reduction does not keep up with incoming damage, and you probably won't have the damage resistances. But by the time you're, you're level 3, your Arcane Ward is blocking 6 damage. Um, and 6 damage is going to be more than half of all incoming damage. It's relatively easy to refresh outside of combat. Uh, and by the time you're level 5, when you get access to Glyph of Warding, it's blocking 10 damage, which is more damage than most incoming damage, especially if combined with resistances and healing. Uh, you will be taking 0 damage from just about everything and can easily refresh your ward, and then you'll never take damage again for the rest of the game. The amount of damage that enemies have to do to overcome this resistance is absurd, and Abjuration Wizard is simply busted in half, just a, an incredibly powerful ability that makes you effectively unkillable in the late game. Conjuration. Conjuration is kind of the control wizard school, um, but you don't really get any meaningful bonuses until level 10. At level 2, you get uh, minor conjuration, create water, which lets you use create water once per short rest without spending a spell slot. Definitely useful and will save you some spell slots, but the, the main consideration behind create water was just the action it took, usually, rather than the spell slot it took. Um, so while that's a, a nice little boost, it's not going to be a huge bonus for your character for the most part. You get Benign Transposition, which is an action-based teleport that you can get for 30 foot of teleport at level 6. Um, action-based teleport is obviously not very good, and it only being 30 feet is pretty bad. You can use it to swap with an ally, which is cool in some circumstances, but pretty rarely is going to come up. The times when this is better than just jumping are, or just walking are honestly not very many because it takes your whole action, so... You can use it maybe to access uh, like the vault behind the gate, some things, some out of combat utility to this spell. Very rarely going to use it in combat. Uh, and then at level 10, you get Focus Conjuration, which is a very good ability because it stops damage that you take from disrupting your concentration on spells. Um, on Conjuration spells. Conjuration spells include a lot of the best Conjuration uh, concentration spells so it is very useful to be able to do that because you can 
uh, concentrate on Sleet Storm or whatever, all of which, or uh, many other very powerful concentration spells without being at risk of losing them. And that's a very powerful effect. That being said, it takes you all the way to level 10 to get that. And I just don't think that it is really worth being in Conjuration Wizard all that way um, to get that one defensive ability. And if you want to not lose concentration on stuff, Abjuration Wizard does that better. Now, I'm not going to place characters that... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to just say Abjuration Wizard does that better for every wizard school, because I think that would be a little reductive. But in this case, Conjuration Wizard's thing that it does is not lose concentration on spells. And not losing concentration on spells, you can definitely accomplish better through Abjuration Wizard or through other wizards that give you more powerful defensive options. And so I just don't think that Conjuration Wizard is uh, worth taking compared to other wizard schools, since the main thing that it does is easily duplicate by the other wizard schools. Divination. Divination gives you portent dice. So when you take a long rest, you roll two 20-sided dice, two d20s, and you carry those portent dice throughout the day. As a reaction, you can then expend one of those portent dice to turn any attack roll or saving throw that you see into that number. Um, so you can just, if you have a 15 stored up and you roll a 2 on an attack roll, you can just say, nope, that 2 is a 15. If you have a natural, if you have a 20 stored up, you can turn any attack into a critical hit. If you have a 2 stored up, you can turn basically any attack into a miss. This is an incredibly powerful effect. Even if it's only limited to a couple times per day, the ability to just uh, know exactly the roll that you are getting on a die is incredibly strong. Low dice can be used to force enemies to fail saving throws, and so you can guarantee landing important crowd control effects in boss fights. High dice can be can force allies to pass saving throws, making you immune to certain effects, or guarantee landing a hit. Obviously, natural ones and natural 20s are the best to roll, but any dice that you roll... Um, of any value has a lot of uh, has a lot of value. Overall, I would rather have very low dice than very high dice typically, but both are incredibly useful. Middle dice are slightly worse, but still sometimes you just need an 11 or higher on the die so you can use your portent die to turn uh, turn any roll into an 11 and just make sure that something actually goes off. You also get at level 6 the ability to regain some of these portent dice because you get these prophecies expert from the expert divination feature. Um, and the prophecies are basically ability uh, conditions that you have to fill during the day to regain a portent die. And um, you can you can stock more portent dice. You don't have to regain a used one. It will also stack up to more than two if you complete a prophecy. Uh, so you get... And the prophecies are pretty e easy to fulfill. They're things like cast a spell of a certain school or do damage of a certain type. Generally speaking, you'll be able to do that pretty easily and arrange to have multiple portent dice throughout the day. Lots of portent dice is incredibly powerful because it gives you a wider range of numbers to choose from and also just lets you affect more things over time. So this is a great addition to the effect. And I think a very cool one, very thematic, that you have to fulfill these conditions to get the extra dice. I think that's very neat. Um, and portent dice are just going to basically remove randomness from your adventuring day at the most important moment, which is nonsensically powerful in effect. I often say that Divination is generically the best wizard, and you'll I often get pushback against that, but I think... Um, that it's very important to understand how good it is to have a role not be random. That's just an incredibly powerful effect. And you guarantee turning a failure into a success or a success into a failure if you have the right portent dice. You also at level 10 have... Uh, <laughs> this ability annoys me, honestly. The third eye, dark vision, and see invisibility abilities. Because you have to activate them every single day, but they last all day. So why are they not just passive? I find that kind of irritating. But uh, And also they're pretty minor benefits, so I usually forget to activate them. Um, but if you want see invisibility or dark vision, you can have them for free starting at level 10. By that point, you probably have better ways to do those things than this ability, but it's a minor boost. 
uh, so you won't say no, but really the strength of Divination Wizard is in the portent dice, and the portent dice are ridiculously strong. You will use these all the time from the beginning of the game to the end of the game, and they will never stop being incredibly powerful. Um, definitely an S tier class. One thing that is kind of, I, I guess I should warn you when playing this class, you will see the portent die reaction pop up constantly, and so if that irritates you, then this wizard probably is not for you, because it's going to interrupt enemy turns every single time, and interrupt allied turns every single time, saying, hey, do you want to use this die? Um, but uh, the power level that you get from that is, in my opinion, worth the irritation, because it's just so good. Enchantment. Enchantment gets Hypnotic Gaze, which once per long rest, you can use an action to charm an enemy within five feet of you. Five feet, of course, is within melee range, so if this ability fails, then you are taking an attack of opportunity if you try to run away from them, or you're just in melee range for whenever their turn happens. If it succeeds, they become charmed and incapacitated, uh, but if they take damage, that effect breaks. So it's basically the same as Sleep or Hypnotic Pattern. Um, and you have to uh, maintain the charm to extend it for multiple turns. Now, you get two turns of duration from it Im immediately, and then you can uh, spend another action to extend it for two more turns. So two turns of duration as on a disable is pretty good. The difference, though, and, and you'll notice that this is somewhat similar to the Archfey Warlock's ability that I praised, so it might be a little surprising that I think that Hypnotic Gaze is terrible, but the difference between 5 feet and 10 feet is massive, and of course this ability only works on a single creature rather than in an AoE. So you, this forces you to put yourself at considerable risk, because in melee is not where your wizard wants to be, causes you to just roll one die to do an effect that is often available in an AoE, and then traps you there, uh, maintaining it if you want it to go for longer than two turns. Enemies can easily be broken out of it because ally their, their allies will come shove them, and that will break them out of the effect. And so, and any stray damage that you are doing uh, will break them out of the hypnotic gaze effect. It's pretty bad and very risky to use, it's nice if it goes off, um, and if there's only one enemy on the field, this can be a reasonable way to disable them without spending a spell slot. But if there are multiple enemies, or if you don't have a good follow-up, this is just a very dangerous thing to use. On the other hand, you get Instinctive Charm at level 6, which gives you a charm effect as a reaction, um, which is a reasonable defensive ability. The enemy has to make a wisdom save, again, against your intelligence, or they will attack a new target. Now, that new target is usually going to be an ally. It doesn't force them to target... Uh, in, in tabletop, this ability forces them to target the nearest creature to them, meaning that if you use it against an archer, they'll almost always shoot one of their buddies. In Baldur's Gate, they just use their normal targeting rules, except can't shoot the spellcaster, so they'll usually shoot usually shoot an ally, but moving an attack from your wizard to anybody else in your party is almost always going to be good, so that's a totally reasonable ability there. It's not going to lower the total damage your party is taking, usually. I mean, some allies might have better defenses than your wizard, so it'll on average lower the incoming damage a little bit, but for the most part it just shifts damage to less vulnerable targets, and that's good. Um, and then at level 10, you get the capstone ability and the good ability of enchantment wizards split enchantment. This means that whenever you cast an enchantment spell that would normally only target one creature, uh, like Hold Person or Otto's Irresistible Dance, you target two creatures. Double Otto's Irresistible Dance is incredible, because it's a no-save disable that can last for many, many turns. Um, and this is just a an extremely powerful feature. One thing that is uh, notable about this is that if you double dominate person on somebody, um, it doesn't work. It only dominates on two people. It doesn't dominate two people. It only dominates one. So that is an irritation, and you can't use this ability with dominate person. But otherwise, it does work and lets you... Uh, double up on your enchantment effects. Hold person you could already target multiple people with by or hold monster by upcasting it, but the ability to do that without upcasting it is really nice, and the ability to double cast Otto's Irresistible Dance is incredible. Um, 
overall, I think that Enchantment Wizard doesn't get that much until the late game, but is the best wizard at late game disables, and that is a very useful niche to fill. Definitely an A-tier character. Evocation. Now, I did an entire build guide on a monoclast evocation wizard, so I'm not going to reiterate every trick and piece of advice that I gave there. For a more detailed breakdown, go check out my lore-friendly Gale build guide called The Best Gale Build in Baldur's Gate 3, but I'll quickly go over what the class gives you and what makes it powerful. Evocation gets Sculpt Spells at level 2, so early on it gets its most important ability, um, which makes allies immune to your evocation spells. They always pass saving throws, and they take no damage from your evocation spells. This is really powerful because it lets you drop a fireball on a big mixed-up fight and, and not fry your allies, but also gives you a bunch of cool tricks, like having your allies stand inside your walls of fire, taking no damage, and protecting them from... from uh, your buddies. You can even stand inside your own wall of fire, although it's possible that you'll lose concentration because you still take the burning damage from the ground being on fire. Um, but being able to stand inside your own wall of fire is still very cool, and as long as you can make the DC 10 concentration save, you'll be able to keep that active and have your whole party fight safely inside a, a wall of billowing flames, both cool and effective. Also, while in a perfect world, you would just position your allies such that they wouldn't get hit by your spells, and that's certainly what you should be striving to do with all the, your other wizards. Obviously, play mistakes happen. Evocation Wizard is easier to play than the other wizard variants, and that's definitely relevant for honor mode. Um, over the course of hundreds of hours of gameplay, you're going to have times when you d make a move and then go, ah, oh, crap, I meant to drop a fireball on that guy and now I can't because my dumb cleric is in the way, or when an enemy moves in a way you wouldn't expect. Evocation Wizard gets around those problems and makes the game a little bit safer and easier to play. At level 6, you get Potent Cantrip, um, which lets you, when enemies make a saving throw against your cantrips, they take half damage instead of zero damage. That's a very minor boost, but it is nice because it turns Acid Splash into uh, from a totally useless spell into one that is actually pretty useful. Half damage just means that you are guaranteed damage and can never miss. You, you can never miss entirely casting Acid Splash, and guaranteed damage on a cantrip is pretty nice because it lets you finish off low health enemies or apply effects. So that is one use for um, that ability, or the only real use for that ability, but it's a, it's a reasonably solid boost to your character. And then at level 10, you get to add intelligence modifier to damage rolls with any evocation spells. So all damaging spells basically get your intelligence modifier added to the damage. Same as the draconic sorcerer's effect, but it hits everything. And so it's especially, while it's as good with Scorching Ray as uh, the fire, sor fire Sorcerer's ability. It's also really good with a bunch of other things, most notably Magic Missile. Magic Missile upcasted fires a bunch of missiles, and each of them doing an extra 5 damage means that you get a lot of guaranteed damage, which cannot miss, and not being able to miss is very, very powerful, um, as we talked about with Divination Wizard and everything. So Evocation Wizard in the very late game becomes a very reliable way to finish off low health enemies, thanks to Acid Splash being guaranteed damage, Magic Missile being high guaranteed damage to a bunch of different enemies, and helps out a lot. Is that worth bumping it up to S tier? I don't think so. I think that these benefits are all nice and make for a very smooth play experience. I recommend an Evocation Wizard if you're a little bit newer to the game as well. Um, but I think that they don't add that much in terms of raw power to your character. If you're playing, if you want to play a damage focused spellcaster, Sorcerer is usually going to be a better bet than Wizard, um, just because casting two spells is better than casting one spell. Uh, I know that shocks everyone. But Evocation wizard does a great job, A tier character. Illusion. Illusion gives you improved Minor Illusion, which sounds really exciting because Minor Illusion is one of the best spells in the game. Um, but what this lets you do is cast Minor Illus Illusion as a bonus action or while silenced. Neither of those things matter a lot because Minor Illusion is not for use in combat, so it just doesn't really matter what action economy it uses, and you're never going to be silenced while casting it unless you've set up the arena somewhat weirdly, like you're trying to pull enemies into a silence bubble that you're already in for some reason. But you probably don't don't want your wizard inside your own silences anyways. Um, 
And if an enemy silences you, you have more important things to do than cast Minor Illusion. This isn't zero use in combat, because it does change enemy facing, and so you can bonus action cast Minor Illusion to make enemies turn away from you, changing their sight lines, and then hide. Or if you're on the same initiative as an ally, bonus action Minor Illusion, and have the ally hide, and then like get off a sneak attack or whatever. So it's not like totally zero use, but most of the time this is a solution in search of a problem um, and is just not going to enhance your minor illusion usage at all. At level 6 you get Sea Invisibility, which is like the Diviner feature in that it's activatable once per short rest, but it's a it's a, an, a spell that lasts until long rest Why is and doesn't take a spell slot. Why is this not passive? I genuinely don't understand why they make you activate these every time, but uh, see invisibility is just not that powerful in effect. So while it's okay to have, it's a, you know, it's a boost you won't turn down, it's certainly not going to draw you to play this class. The big draw at level 10 is Illusory Self, which lets you, as a reaction, just cause an attack to miss. Um, you, you get to, once per short rest, just turn a hit against you into a miss. That is really powerful, because it doesn't roll dice, and not rolling dice is really, really good. Once per short rest is a reasonable amount of times to do this, but um, one downside of it, of course, is that it doesn't work very well against multi-attacks, because the, the enemy will just uh, continue to hit you if you're multi-attacking. And overall, it is probably a little bit worse than just having a divination wizard and rolling low portent dice. Um, the missing... The ability to turn a hit into a miss is very good, but not getting it until level 10 holds it back significantly. And again, I feel like this defensive ability is duplicated better by uh, Divination Wizard for the most part. It's the the If the enemy is attacking you specifically, the Illusory Self is usually better than a Portent Die because it's a, on a short rest cooldown, so it's a slightly less expensive resource, uh, sort of, in some ways. Um, and you don't have to have exactly the die that you need, so you're guaranteed to be able to use it. But 90% uh, of the time, Divination Wizard is going to be able to do this same thing and then also do a thousand other things with their ability. So I just don't think Illusion Wizard stacks up very well and is also in the outclassed wizard tier. Necromancer. Necromancers are for summoning. They get a couple non-summoning related abilities, but all their abilities that really matter focus on summer summoning. At level 2, they get Grim Harvest, which heals you whenever you kill an enemy with a spell. Uh, double the, the spell slot uh, if it's a normal spell, or triple if it's a necromancy spell. Notably, this doesn't work with Bone Chill, which is annoying, because that's the necromancy spell you're by far most likely to actually kill enemies with. All the damaging necromancy spells, all the leveled damaging necromancy spells are bad, especially with the Staff of Cherished Necromancy bug fixed, so you're never going to be using this to with a necromancy spell. That means you're getting a very small amount of healing, um, whenever you kill an enemy with a leveled spell, and that's not something that you aim to be doing. This isn't a sorcerer or an evocation wizard, and wizards typically don't focus on damaging spells at all, so this ability almost never comes up, and when it does come up, it's not relevant. Compare it to the Fiend Warlock's ability where they gain temporary hit points. That's way better because it is proactive rather than reactive. Temporary hit points can go over your maximum, and also they get more of them and don't have to specifically use a spell to do it. This ability is going to be, I don't know, you'll maybe make uh, like t 10, 20 hit points with it over the course of the game and probably have made a suboptimal choice in order to do so just because it's cool. Uh, so most of the time this ability won't come up. At level 10, I'm skipping level 6 for the moment, you get you get resistance to necrotic damage, uh, which is a useful damage resistance. There's some a lot of Act 3 enemies that do necrotic damage. Fewer than Act 2, of course, but still a lot, and so it's a useful damage resistance. Damage resistances are fine on wizards. Not spectacular, because you don't want them to be taking hits in the first place, but not not a terrible uh, ability. And your hit point total can't be reduced, but or hit point maximum can't be reduced, which almost never matters, but it, I suppose is a nice little bonus. Um, but the main thing that you get for Necromancer Wizards are big buffs to Animate Dead. You gain Animate Dead for free at level 6, and you get to 
summon an additional corpse every time you cast Animate Dead. That means with a third level slot, you get two zombies or skeletons. With a fourth level slot, you get four. With a fifth level slot, you get two uh, ghouls. And with a sixth level slot, you get a whole horde of ghouls. These summons also get big buffs. They get additional hit points equal to your wizard level, which often uh, like doubles their hit points because these are, are pretty weak minions overall. And your proficiency bonus is added to their damage. When you when you have four archers, four skeleton archers shooting, that's a lot of additional damage that you're doing, provided they're hitting pretty regularly, and a lot more hit points for enemies to get through. That is a very nice ability. The downside, of course, is that you don't you you still don't want to spend a level six spell slot on animate dead. You'd much rather use a uh, uh, myrmidon summon, still just way better than two ghouls. Um, and so you're still probably using a fourth level spell slot the way you would for any other wizard, and just getting on animate dead, uh, and just getting three four skeletons instead of three but a 33 percent increase to efficiency of your skeletons plus the additional hit points and damage is very good and for a summon focused character necromancer wizard does very well you don't get a lot as you level up past level six and so you'll typically see this character in multi-classes rather than as monoclass but it's still a, a, a very solid bonus to a monoclass build summon builds are incredibly strong in Baldur's gate and this build enables them pretty well definitely a tier i think it gets just just very solid abilities at level 6, even if it doesn't have any other abilities worth mentioning. Transmutation. Transmutation is an interesting one, because in Baldur's Gate 3, it's almost always seen as a camp follower, uh, just preparing potions and passing off the transmuter stone, something you, that you can no longer do as of patch 6, more than it is as an active member of the party. However, the abilities that you get for an active play with this character are still pretty reasonable. Um, at least one of them is quite relevant and one of them is pretty is is nice so i think that this character actually is still totally playable not as a camp follower even though that's what people mostly use it as um at level two, you get Experimental Alchemy, where you brew two potions instead of one when you combine extracts if you succeed a DC 15 medicine check. A uh, DC 15 medicine check is not super easy to succeed at early levels with this character. Wizards do get medicine proficiency, but typically won't have high wisdom, especially if you're not building this as a dedicated camp caster. Um, but even the small amount of bonuses here will let you have way more access to alchemy over the course of the game. Now, the game's economy is totally broken. You can have infinite ingredients and infinite access to alchemy for most potions. So how much that matters depends on sort of how much you're willing to abuse the game's broken economy. I'm going to assume that you are trying to play the game at least relatively reasonably. And so, you know, not like respecking constantly to refresh merchant inventories and doing that uh, over and over again to max out all your potions. And so this ability comes into play occasionally and is a nice little boost to your economy, giving you extra potions. Uh, I wouldn't say it's the most powerful ability in the world, but it's definitely useful if you have this character brewing, uh, doing your alchemy. I will say that having to have one specific character do all your alchemy is mildly annoying, but... Um, especially if it's a wizard who doesn't have high strength, because it's it's usually better just to have your highest strength character carry all your alchemy ingredients to make it just less irritating to pass them around camp. But since they've fixed some of the inventory systems, that's a little bit less of a problem. You also at level 6 get the Transmuter's Stone, which lets you uh, set it to a number of abilities um, and then carry it around, getting a passive benefit with, while it's in your inventory. You can also give it to an ally, although which you used to be able to do from camp and they would get to keep it. Now it disappears if you leave camp, so this has to be an active member of your party if you want to pass it off to an ally. The benefits that you can get... Really, there's one that's way better than the others, but you can get various benefits like dark vision, speed, resistance to a damage type, but most importantly, you can get constitution save proficiency, which includes proficiency on concentration saves. This is not as powerful an ability as the Conjuration Wizard's ability to uh, just ignore concentration saves caused by damage on conjuration spells, but is still very powerful. A wizard with constitution save proficiency is a lot better at not failing concentration on spells. Also, not being limited to conjuration spells specifically makes it a little bit better as well, which is um, pretty nice. Uh, just, just a little more 
flexible when you're trying to decide how to use this ability. Generally speaking, that's the one that you want to be running around with is con save proficiency, and you probably just want to keep it on the wizard so that they just never lose concentration on their spells. And then at level 10, you can turn into a blue jay, which uh, lets you fly, but if you take damage, you basically immediately lose the form. Obviously, this is a lot worse than just the passive flight that Draconic Sorcerer gets, but still a, a very small boost to your late game mobility. Same problem as with the Draconic Sorcerer ability, though. By level 10, you should definitely have sorted out all your mobility issues and have mobility items and everything, spells learned and everything, as appropriate so that your character can move around. So this is more a for fun and flavor thing than it is a powerful thing. That being said, uh, just some extra potions over the course of the game and the ability to gain con save proficiency are still pretty nice for a wizard, um, and so I'm going to say that this is an A-tier character. I don't believe that it's superseded by Conjuration Wizard's ability, because that's only for Conjuration, uh, and comes much later in the build. Transmutation Wizard is going to lose concentration much less often at, because of its powerful ability. Also, the damage, the elemental damage resistance in some encounters can be useful, but mostly it's, this is just you get some more potions and lose concentration less, less often, and it doesn't take much for Wizard to be an A-tier character because it's already just a very good base chassis. All right, my friends, this has been the complete look at every subclass in the game as monoclass characters going into their strengths and weaknesses. And I'm very happy with this list. I think it was really fun to go over every single subclass. Um, and we will be back with multi-classed characters, both base classes and subclasses. I'm not, I'm still not 100% sure how I'm going to structure that tier list, but I will be back and uh, show you how that works when we get there. I'm going to, uh, let me, let me zoom out here so that you have a moment to take a screenshot of the final list. I think one thing that is really interesting about this list is just how well balanced the game actually is in terms of the subclasses. Uh, I think this list is a testament to the balance work and design that went into this game because very few classes missed on power level and often they missed on power level for, for good reasons. Like Wild Magic Sorcerer, for example, you wouldn't want it not to be C tier because the whole point is that it makes funny random things happen. And so, uh, only a few classes actually missed and were intended to be really powerful, and many of those were intended to be actually missed on balance in, in a way that I think was unintentional, and those classes often can be fixed through very simple additions of multi-classes, which is a core component of the game. I'm going to give you all a moment to look at this tier list and just kind of uh, absorb it or take screenshots or whatever you do, and then because a couple people requested it, I will also move all these outclassed classes to the tiers that I would have them in, just so that you have a visual sense of where I would put those as well. Um, because, of course, a lot of those are not that much worse. That they're not any worse than their base classes, so they're still powerful characters in their own right, and it's useful to have that visual reference as well. So take a look. This is the final tier list as I have presented it, and then we're going to move these outclassed characters just for the visual reference. Valor Bard, definitely A tier. Trickery Cleric, I think still A tier, even though it is the thing that it does. Tempest Cleric just does better. Um, Champion Fighter in B, and all the Paladins and Wizards go in A. So this gives you more of a sense of where I would place everything if the outclassed tier list didn't exist. Outclassed section didn't exist, but I did want to give you a visual reference for what it would look like, for, for which classes are totally superseded by other classes in their, uh, other subclasses within their class. All right, my friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this video, and of course, as always, if you have, do feel free to leave a comment, uh, let me know if you think I missed on anything, um, and of course, you can like the video, that helps me out a ton with the algorithm, helps new people see my stuff, which I appreciate very much. And you can subscribe to my channel for more tier lists like this, including the upcoming multi-class tier list, more exciting Baldur's Gate things, and other strategy game content. And of course, if you have really enjoyed this and want to support me further, you can feel free to give me some money using the buttons below the video. Cheers, my friends. I'll catch you next time.